now, as well as a photographer. Um, that photo act there, I actually am photographing a bee on the ground. It does look like I'm just photographing dirt, but I'm not. Um, regarding my artwork, I primarily work with ballpoint pen and sugar. You can see three ballpoint pen pieces up there, as well as the lion, which is made out of sugar. And it's, uh, regarding speaking engagements, I do that pretty much all the time. I'm also a TEDx speaker as well. Regarding my photography, I primarily photograph native bees, the plants that they visit, as well as their ecosystems. Primarily, I do this in California, but if you look at the picture in the lower right-hand corner there, that's clearly not California. I do travel out of the country and do this a little bit as well. So a lot of people would refer to me as a community scientist. A uh, community scientist is an amateur scientist who conducts scientific research in a field that they don't hold their degree in. I know a lot of people would refer to that as a citizen scientist, but politically, the last few years, the word citizen, the meaning has changed from somebody who doesn't hold a degree to someone who is undocumented. So to be more inclusive, we started to use community scientist. Uh, so again, what I do, I photograph bees, document their behavior, notate the plants they're present on, and also keep track of things like times, dates, and weather. Actually, every single location that I visit, I have an Excel sheet that I update every year, and it's one way that I've actually been able to keep track of things like climate change and developing habitats. So how I got started, I don't know if anyone's seen this quote before, if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would only have four years of life left. No more bees, no more pollination, no more plants, no more animals, no more man. And that quote's attributed to Albert Einstein. Um, so I don't know if anyone else actually is aware that that quote is not true. Is anyone aware? Yes, so a couple people in the back there. Um, so what's really interesting about this quote, it was actually made up in the 90s, and if you're at all familiar with Albert Einstein, he passed away a little bit before that, in about 1955, so there's a little bit of a gap in between him uh, supposedly saying this and passing away. Um, so I actually saw this online, and I, like most people, thought it was true. Also, really wanted to get invested in saving the bees and helping, so I wanted to do that through photography. And at the time, I also thought this was about honeybees. So I actually went out and took pictures with my cell phone of honeybees. And I took a lot of pictures of honeybees. Just a lot of pictures exclusively of honeybees. And then I took this photo. And it's clearly a bee, but it's not a honeybee. So I went back to the people at the time who I thought were bee experts, which were beekeepers, and asked them, hey, what kind of bee is this? And they didn't know. So of all places, I ended up going to Facebook. And I ran into a group there that was full of people called militologists. And after talking to them a bit, I realized that it was actually militologists, not beekeepers, that were bee experts. And they also drew, introduced me to a new term called native bees. And they said that this was a native bee, and she's called an andrina, or a mining bee. And we actually saw one in the documentary we just watched. And what was really interesting, too, after talking to these militologists, is they said that it was actually native bees, not honeybees, that were threatened or possibly endangered. So this actually changed everything I was working on. I was like, oh my gosh, I've wasted so much time on these honeybees. Let me go back to those locations I was at before, try to find the native bees. I spent months in gardens, just public areas, looking for these native bees. And for some reason, I wasn't finding them, but the honeybees were everywhere. And that brings me to the Crescent Farm at the LA Arboretum, which is a really great garden if anyone hasn't been there before. Um, but the horticulturalists there had taken some pictures of native bees, about five different species he'd seen all in one day, just in this like one acre patch of garden. And I thought, okay, this is kind of weird. Why are there so many native bees here when I've been going out looking for months and haven't found them? Well, it turns out the Crescent Farm is a garden full of native plants. So the first day I went there, I actually took these photos. So these are some of my very first photos of native bees. And obviously the reason there were so many native bees there was because there were native plants there. So I'm sure a lot of you guys know this already, but what is a native plant, just in case you're wondering? A plant is considered native if it has occurred naturally in a particular region or ecosystem where it currently exists without human introduction. So 
That can mean it's native to the entire United States, it could be native to California, or even an area as small as your zip code. So native plants, native bees, native plants can potentially have a symbiotic relationship with native plants. So native plants can support native bees, native bees support native plants. So save the native bees also means save the native plants and vice versa. So saving native plants helps so many more pollinators than just bees as well. It can also help beetles, bats, birds, butterflies, just so many different creatures. And also I want to kind of give a breakdown of the differences between honeybees and native bees because I feel like there's a lot of confusion with this. So just really broken down simply here. Uh, first off, honeybees are not threatened or endangered. Native bees are potentially threatened or endangered. Honeybees, the ones that are in the US, are from Europe. Native bees are from where they currently reside. So again, like native plants, they could be native to the entire United States, California, or even your zip code. Honeybees drink water provided by people. Native bees get all of their hydration from plants, so you actually don't need to put water out for them. Honeybees are generalist pollinators, meaning they'll try and pollinate everything. And a lot of people think that's great because they're like, oh, they'll pollinate all of these flowers, but they actually are not very good pollinators. They have about a 5% pollination rate. Native bees can also be generalist pollinators, but they can also be specialist pollinators, meaning they'll pollinate one family of plants like asters, asteraceae, like sunflowers, um, but they can also be um, generalist as well. So honeybees are also detrimental to native bees, and this is in a couple of ways. They can actually outcompete native bees for resources. So since they're from Europe, they're initially um, used to colder climates. So a lot of times you'll see honeybees out earlier in the morning or later in the evening. So they'll actually take the resources from flowers a lot of times before the native bees are even up and out. Um, another thing too is they actually have something called uh, deformed wing virus, which they get from varroa mites, which is a mite that infects their hive. So there are some adult honeybees that are actually carriers. They're not physically impacted by this. So what they'll do is they'll actually visit flowers in the area and they'll infect the pollen with a deformed wing virus and then other bees will visit that same flower, specifically bumblebees that's been found in. They'll take that pollen back to their hive, developing bees eat the pollen and guess what we're starting to find? Bumblebees with small wings. Um, one way to actually stop that, um, there was a study that came out, I think it was either last year or the year before, but they said if there's a higher diversity of plants in the area, bumblebees are less likely to be impacted. So that's a great reason to put more native plants in your yard. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but native bees are also threatened by climate change. Honeybees live in colonies. Native bees, about 70% are ground nesting, 30% are cavity nesting, and 90% are solitary. All right, so I'm gonna be saying a lot of scientific names here, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know this already since you're here, but I just decided to kind of break it down with people. So people, our common name is either humans or people, but our scientific name is Homo sapiens. So Homo is our genus, sapiens is our species. So a lot of bees that I'm gonna be talking about, I'm gonna be saying like Perdita interrupta, Perdita minima, that's the genus and the species. So an example of that here is the Perdita masuda. And this is also a really cool bee, um, one, because it was my very first contribution to community science, but I think it's an example of what anyone could actually do if they go out and look in their garden or just outside in nature. Um, so this is a bee that had actually never been photographed alive before. And if you could see the lower right-hand corner there, that's the male. He has this little duck face feature. No one knew what the purpose of that was. So the way a lot of militologists study bees is they'll actually put out something called a tan trap, which is a dish with some liquid in there. And bees will fly into it, they'll pass away, and then um, scientists will take their bodies back to the lab and look at them there. But since no one had been looking at this bee alive before, they didn't know the purpose of that feature. And since I only looked at them alive, Within 30 minutes, I actually saw the male using that facial feature. So what he's actually doing there is he's trapping the female by pinning her antenna on either side of that little duck face feature so she can't fly away, and he's trying to mate with her. So it's a really positive feature, but it's also kind of like if someone else is out there looking, they could find the same thing, which is really cool. Um, and this was in the Mojave Desert. What's also really cool about this plant, this buckwheat, everything on it 
was a similar color of like yellow or red to the flower. It really seemed like they had all evolved together, which I just thought was a really cool thing. Um, also, one thing that's really cool about specialist pollinators, since they have that relationship with flowers, you can actually find the pollinator by looking for the flower, which is what happened with this bee. So this is called their Perdita minima, and it's one of the smallest bees in the world. It's the smallest known bee in North America, and it's about two millimeters. If you look at the quarter there, in the lower right-hand corner, the flower, that's what the bee is on. So this bee is about the size of a letter on a quarter. And you can tell the female is the female because she's the one with pollen on her back legs, and then the male is like flapping his wings, looking around for, for females. Um, and one thing that was also great about this area is a lot of times when people think of ecosystems, they'll think of like a whole desert or like a forest, something really large. This was actually on a sidewalk. It was a patch of flowers that about, were about two square feet, so it was really, really tiny. So ecosystems can be really small. And one really cool thing about this is, uh, this bee is a great example of something that was thought to be really difficult to ID in science, but because of evolving cameras, more people can contribute. So this bee is called a Lassia glossum dialectus, and it's just known as a bee that no one can identify the species. But again, because of cameras developing, you can take photos now and get them ID'd as well. And then I also wanted to show you some other creatures that are on this fan mat. So we have a bunch of wasps on the outside, and that center photo is a mite called a Paracarsotomus macropalpus. Um, so it's a really long name, but it's also one of the fastest land animals on Earth relative to its size. It's only about 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters, but if it was the size of a person, it'd run about 1,300 miles an hour. So it's really fast. It's also why it's not 100% in focus, because it was running. So I just wanted to show you guys a little video that I made of life on the sand mat. So this is a neighborhood in Apple Valley. And just to give you perspective here, that wasp is about 1.5 millimeters. And that's a carpenter ant looking very large. And in the lower right hand corner, there is the Perdita minima. So what's really cool about this bee is she actually collects pollen on her chest and then she goes into a tripod stance and then she takes it off her chest, she licks it with her front, uh, with her mandibles, wetting it and then packs it onto her back legs. Yeah, so it's a little documentary I like to make. Um, I like to make these about micro ecosystems because I just think it's really fascinating. Yeah, so next time you're in your neighborhood on a walk, if you see a little patch of flowers, maybe you get down on the ground and see what's there. Um, also, symbiotic relationships don't just exist in the bee world, they also exist in the wasp world. So this is a wasp that you can actually identify by the flower that it's on. This is a California brittle bush. So whenever you see a picture of this wasp, it's always on this flower. Uh, it's also not just in the insect world. Um, this is a sea anemone, sea anemone and a clownfish. 
I know a lot of people know about these guys specifically because of Finding Nemo, but um, really cool symbiotic relationship. The clownfish protects the sea anemone from other creatures around it because the sea anemone has a coating on its body where it can't get stung, um, but the clownfish also attracts a lot of food for the sea anemone to eat, so it's mutually beneficial. Um, but climate change is also impacting symbiotic relationships as well. I like to bring this one up because I feel like it's a really great example that people are very aware of. So in 2019, 2020, there was a giant oceanic temperature gradient. Normally happens every year, but because of climate change, it was really exacerbated. So Australia had a lot of drought and a lot of water was dumped into Eastern Africa, which wasn't talked about as much. But because of the drought in Australia, there were a lot of fires and a lot of eucalyptus actually burned. And if you're at all familiar with koalas, the only thing they eat is eucalyptus. So a lot of the ones that actually survived, they ended up starving. But because they're very large, cute, and cuddly, and people like them, people jump in to save them. The same thing, similar things are happening to other creatures as well, like honeybees, native bees. Um, but because they're not as cute and cuddly for a lot of people, a lot of people are scared of them, they're not jumping in to save them. So what can we do? Um, there's a lot of things that we can do, but I think the two easiest things are one, document to raise awareness, and also plant native plants in our yards. So there's this app called iNaturalist. Is anyone familiar with it? Oh, pretty much everybody. Okay, great. Um, so I actually created two projects on there. So these are bee projects, and they actually help you find native bees in your area. It's one great way to help identify them. There's the California native bees and Los Angeles native bees. So I actually made these to exclude honeybees specifically because so many people are taking pictures of honeybees and putting them on a naturalist. So if you just kind of want to weed those out, go to these projects. All right. Okay, so Arlington Garden, wonderful garden in Pasadena. I don't know if anyone's been there. Yes. Um, so I, I love to bring this garden up because I used to spend a lot of time there and there was this bee that I was used to seeing every single time I would visit. It's called a Xylocopa sonorina. This is the male right here. And I thought this bee had left the garden in 2018. I had not seen it for years. But they actually did a nature walk or a bio blitz there. And on the very first nature walk, they actually saw this bee. So that's that picture in uh, 2021. This is an example of what can happen if only one person is looking for creatures out in the wild. If it's just me looking or just one other person, they might miss things. This could be happening a lot with nature. So that's why it's a great idea to get more people involved in community science because there's a lot of things that we're potentially missing that everyone could easily contribute to. And the Santa Monica Mountains, one of my favorite places to visit in Southern California. You can actually figure out what bees are present based on what flowers are present. So these are uh, morning glories. And when the morning glories start to show up, I'd say like February, depending on the rain, you'll actually see this bee. This is a diadacia by tuberculata. And you can see a male and female here keeping the population going. And right here, you can actually see a female. So one way that you know this bee is present, you'll see these little turrets here. They're like little chimneys that the female actually constructs. And if you look on the right side there, you can actually see a female sleeping with her feet up in the turret. And she has a bunch of pollen on her, her little legs. So my friend actually made this video. So if you go to Satwiwa um, for about three months, I'd say just the beginning part of the year, you might see a guy just laying on the ground every single day. His name's James. Um, he records these bees. He's been doing it for about five years. He made this video. And this is what an aggregation of these bees look like. So you see a lot of these bees together, and you might think, oh, these are eusocial bees or communal bees. They're actually solitary. Um, but solitary bees that live together like this, it's called an aggregation, it's like a neighborhood. So each one of those little turrets is their own home. And what's really cool about native bees is they rarely ever sting. So you can actually walk amongst these guys and not worry about getting stung. All right, I'm gonna skip ahead here. So some other bees that you might see are Eucera and Dufouria. So these bees also show up at the same time as morning glories. There's also deerweed and asteraceae, which is asters and sunflowers. So when those flowers start to show up, you'll start to see these bees. Um, and one really cool thing about this slide is you can actually really easily distinguish male bees from female bees. So if you're looking at the, sorry, I keep going back and forth between right and left. Uh, your left, 
um, that is a female bee, the gray bee there. That's called an Anthophora at Warzii. And one way that you can tell she's a female is because she has really fluffy hair on her back leg. It's called plumose hair, and that's where she carries her pollen. Also, she has hair on her face. Opposed to the male in, sorry, you're right. Um, he has a facial plate. It's called a clippiest facial feature, which is something that male bees have. Also, if you look at his middle leg, he has a little fan there. I know if you guys remember from the documentary where the males were like kind of fanning the female's antenna. So he does that as well, and he also covers up her eyes when he's mating with her. Um, and it, the, the lower corner here, the bee with the white face, that's another clippiest facial feature. This is actually a haverpoda, which looks really similar to Anthophora. And then we have the black bee with blue eyes in the other corner. That is called a hoplitis bee. And she is a female that actually carries pollen on the underside of her abdomen, so like the leafcutter bees that we saw in the documentary we just watched. And then we also have a kleptoparasitic bee, which is similar to the nomada in the documentary we watched. Um, so this is a Brachium electrica californica. The females actually don't create burrows. They go into a host bee's burrow, lay an egg. Their egg hatches, consumes the egg or larva of the host bee and eats all of the pollen. So it's kind of like population control for some other bees. Uh, we also have a male megachile. We have a female hoplitis in the lower left-hand corner. She has pollen on the underside of her abdomen. So Osmia bees, that's the one in the lower right-hand corner. One way you can tell them apart from females, they have longer antenna, and they also have a lot of facial hair. Sometimes they'll even have little mustaches. So climate change close to home. This is the Santa Monica Mountains. I don't know if ever, anyone ever visits out there. Um, I think this is just a beautiful, beautiful area, and a lot of other people agree with that, so they've actually started moving out there. And because it's so beautiful, biodiverse, and there's a lot of people out there, the biodiversity is actually going down. And because of climate change as well, there's more fires in that area. So people who live in the Santa Monica Mountains actually started asking a conservancy there to go through and start bulldozing or going through with a tractor to cut down a lot of native plants. So this is an area that I actually, I'm really sad about this because I did not take a photo of what it looked like before they came through with the tractor. Um, but this was the 4th of July weekend or week right after they came through and you can just see everything is completely cut down and you can see the, uh, the tracks right there. And this is actually something that's happening in a lot of different places, not just in California, but all over the world. Um, up until about two or three years ago, the main reason for decline in bees or just animals or plants, different organisms, was actually habitat loss. But recently, until about two or three years ago, it actually changed to climate change. And I just want to show you a couple of the species of bees that I saw at this location. And I'd actually photographed over 41 different species of bees here. And after they went through the tractor, I actually have not seen a single species of bee. And I ended up going back again last year, and I was really hopeful because a lot of different flowers had started to actually come back. I was really excited, and they came through with the tractor again. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be a yearly thing, it seems like now. Um, Anza Borrego, I don't know if anyone's been there, Borrego Springs. Yes, great. Um, I absolutely love the desert. It's one of my favorite places to go. Um, it's only like two, three hours, which is not that far from us. Um, but there's this bee that's there. This is called a Megachile brownie. And it's also the only photo of a living representative of its species. And I actually found this bee because I was looking for a bee that had a symbiotic relationship with the flower that it's on. This is called a Sorothamus tree. And when I took this photo, I didn't realize it was a really rare bee. It's only been collected two times post 2000. So when I realized it was rare, I was like, okay, I gotta go back. But it was about 110 the first day I was there. I saw like over 100 native bees, about three or four different species. And I wasn't able to go back for another week and that entire week it had been over 110. So I was like, okay, this is, it's probably still gonna be hot when I go back. Uh, when I went back, it was actually 117 degrees, so it was pretty warm. Um, so this is what the plant is supposed to look like, but because it was so hot there, because of climate change, it was the third year of a drought, 
this is what the plant actually looked like. And so I wasn't really sure if the bees would be there when I went back. Um, so when I actually went back about seven days later, I went about 4 a.m. because I wanted to like try and find some sleeping ones. And I, it was actually kind of dark, like really, really dark. So I actually kind of got scared and stayed in my car for a bit. So I waited until the sun came up, which was about 5.30. Uh, but as soon as I opened my car door, there was just this loud hum. And this is something that's happening so much in nature. I don't know if anyone knows what that hum is, but it's just hundreds of bees. And they were all honeybees. And keep in mind, this was in the middle of the desert. So there were no houses around. This was honeybees that had actually gotten out in nature. And these, there was actually uh, two of these trees, and both of them were barely blooming. They were the only things blooming for miles. So the honeybees just kind of swarmed over everything. And I started walking around the trees, and I didn't see any native bees. And this had only been after a week. And completely random, wasn't on the forecast, but these dark clouds appeared. And they were rain clouds, and it just started raining, pouring for like five minutes. And as soon as it cleared up, I saw a really beautiful dub double rainbow. And the hum completely disappeared after the rain. And I was like, let me just walk around these bushes one more time. And when I did, I found this one individual. She was drying herself off from the rain, so it gave me plenty of time to take photos of her, uh, but this was the only native bee I saw that day. So this is an example of what's happening, not just in nature, but also in our neighborhoods as well. So the Trinity Alps, this was my very first bee adventure. Uh, this is in Northern California, and if anyone ever has a chance to go, yeah, you've gone, okay, yeah, the Trinity Alps is beautiful. Um, so this was also when I thought I was in really good shape. Um, so I was like, oh, I walk around the desert, go to Santa Monica Mountains. And I was like, it's only nine and a half miles up a mountain. Um, I probably like a 30, 40 pound backpack. It took like an hour a mile. So about nine and a half hours walking up this mountain. And about by hour five, I was kind of done. But I didn't want to turn around. Um, basically, I went there to look for a bee called a Bombus franklini, which is this bee. So it's one of... California's four endangered bumblebees. And this bee, this is actually the very last photo of it, was taken by Robin Thorpe, who was a bumblebee expert in August of 2006. And one thing that's really interesting is this bee is called endangered, but no one's seen it since 2006. It actually wasn't officially listed as endangered until about three years ago. So this is something that's happening a lot in the insect world is uh, what's actually happening. It takes a long time to actually be reflected in science. So this bee might be extinct. Um, but yeah, I went to the Trinity Alps, spent about 10 days up there to try and find it. Unfortunately, didn't find the bee, but found this one. So this is Alassia glossum symbriallicus. It's a high elevation specialist. And this is also the only photo of a living representative of this species. So kind of proud of that. Didn't find the bubble bee. Found this really cool one instead. Um, yeah. And then this is an example of what anyone could do with community science. So I was in the grasslands in Central Valley. Um, literally, this bee was sleeping right in front of my parking spot at the San Jacinto uh, Wildlife Area. And this is a bee that also had never been photographed alive, and it was also one of the most difficult bees I've ever ID'd. So one thing that's really interesting about this bee is if you look at the key, which is kind of a document that helps you ID bees to hopefully species, is no one knew what this bee, uh, this bee is a parasite, so it has a host species. It, again, goes into a burrow, lays an egg. No one knew what its host species was. But because I was out there observing it, I actually found out what the host was. And again, this was just right in front of my car in a parking lot just because I spent a few hours out there. Um, and what's also really cool, too, is this bee, um, it's also the first observation since the 60s, 1960s. So again, community science. Um, my first trip out of the country, I was so excited for this. This was Belize. I actually went, went with a bunch of bat people, so I was kind of the oddball there. Um, but there's a bee that is crepuscular, so it's a dusk dawn bee. So it shows up about 
90 minutes before sun, sunrise, 90 minutes after sunset. And it had never been seen in this location before. Um, also, it was the complete wrong time of the year, but I was like, hey, I don't have another chance to go, so let me just try it. So I um, made these really, really rinky-dink sort of light traps of towels from my hotel room and just hung them up in the forest on clothes hangers and put like one of them had a flashlight, the other one had a black light, and I was like, let me just see what happens. Within 10 minutes, the bee showed up. So you might call that dumb luck, but hey, um, I traveled to Julie's and I found the bee within like 10 minutes, so then I had a lot of free time. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's really cool. Um, and then native landscaping, this is my friend Paloma Jard. And she posted this photo on Instagram, and when I saw that she had a yard that looked like this, I was like, oh my gosh, can I please visit? And she was like, sure. Um, so I want to get into a couple of features. This isn't actually her yard, but she does implement these. This is called the watershed approach for landscaping. Don't know if anyone's familiar with that. So watershed approach is a land area that drains into a common waterway, such as a lake, a stream, estuary, wetland, aquifer, or even the ocean. So you have different areas of land that are at different levels. So you can actually see there's higher levels where the flowers are and then the rocks are at lower levels. So that's where the water drains to. So there's three key principles in the watershed landscaping approach. Uh, one, you wanna build healthy living soil that is biologically diverse and has developed a sponge-like structure to hold water. Um, so it's gonna hold and release rainwater, cycling carbon, nutrients, promoting biodiversity for plant resiliency. There's also gonna be things like earthworms, bacteria, anthropods, fungi, and et cetera. So a lot of times when people think of um, saving the bees, they think of just the bees, but it actually starts at the base. So healthy soil is the very first thing. And think of soil as a ecosystem. So within ecosystems, um, there's a lot of things that people potentially won't like, like fungus, or like different anthropods, even spiders, things like that. But I also think of it as kind of like a game of Jenga, like the blocks that you stick on top of each other. If you keep removing things that you don't like, it's not really stable. So think of soil as the base and think of each like game of Jenga, like stacked on top of each other. It's like the soil, the, the plants, the pollinators, the mammals on top of that. So you're also gonna treat rainwater as a resource. Retention can be accomplished by creating small divots, like here where the rocks are, um, in basins and contours. So impermeable surfaces can be made permeable and used as capture areas for redirection of water into landscape. You can also use rain barrels to store water. So about an inch of rain can actually give you a couple hundred gallons of water, and you can actually use that to um, water your plants when we're in the middle of another drought. We seem to be in the middle of a lot of rain this year, so who knows what'll be happening. Um, also, plant native plants. So what's really cool too about my friend Paloma's yard is she has this bee, which is called a Pudita interrupta, and it's a poppy specialist. And this bee is really cool because it's very, very rare. It's not a bee that you're gonna see a lot. And she has a huge population in her yard. So this bee's a poppy specialist, and any bee that's a poppy specialist also has to have a symbiotic relationship with another plant because poppies don't actually produce nectar. So if you have poppies and then cryptantha or a popcorn flower in your yard, you might have this bee. So this bee is only present as an adult in about like March, April. And also, they're really easy to know if you have them in your yard because the males spend their entire adult life on poppies waiting for females to show up. Also, she has this bee in her yard too. So this is a Bombus crotchii. It's one of California's four endangered bumblebees. So after my first time visiting her yard, she spent a lot of time out in the yard just like looking to see what would show up. And she actually photographed this bee. This is one of my photos from uh, the Crescent Farm at Arlington Garden. But not only does she have a rare bee, she also has an endangered bee in her yard. And that's because she created the habitat to sustain these guys. So maintaining a native environment, I'm sure a lot of you guys know this already, but one thing that's really great is you don't need a lot of pesticides or herbicides or any at all potentially. So pesticides, as you guys are aware, they kill insects that can also potentially benefit plants. Herbicides kill plants that could potentially benefit insects. So in a native 
environment in your yard, there's going to be different creatures that actually keep population control. So I know I was talking about how some people might not like fungi. Higher up in the food chain a little bit, maybe like aphids. A lot of people really don't like aphids, but they're part of a healthy ecosystem in your yard. So native landscape will naturally keep a healthy balance between insects or plants, so there's little or no need for these things. So just an example, let's say for some reason my friend Paloma did not like the California poppy bee, the Prudita interrupta, and she just sprayed a bunch of pesticides on them who's gonna pollinate the poppies. Let's say for some reason, who knows why, she didn't like the poppies and she sprayed a bunch of herbicides, what's gonna happen to the bee? So these things have more impact than just their intended targets. So that brings me to this indicator insect. So I call this an indicator insect because if you have this in your yard, it's an indication that you have a healthy ecosystem. And that's because this insect relies on another insect that we consider a pest to actually survive. So one thing about this indicator insect is it's really, really tiny. So a lot of times people don't even know it's in their yard. So you can actually see it there on the right-hand side of the quarter. And there it is at Arlington Garden in Pasadena. So they have a nice ecosystem as well. So what's really cool about this wasp is the females do something called ovipositing. They'll stick a egg inside the body of the aphid. And then the egg will develop in the body of the aphid, kind of turn it into a cocoon. And if you ever see aphids that are kind of swollen up like that, then you know there's, an aphid, there's a wasp inside of it. So population control. And then when the wasp is an adult and ready to close or emerge, they chew a little hole out of the back of the aphid and pop out, keeping the population going. Uh, another indicator insect, I feel like a lot more people are familiar with this one because they're just really beautiful, I think. These are lace wings. So you can see the egg there, which is on a little stick. Uh, there's the larva as well and the adult at the bottom. So these consume aphids, mealybugs, thrips, a lot of things that people consider pests in their garden as well. Um, and here's a picture of the thrips. And you can tell how small they are because of little pollen grains on there. Um, but what's really cool about these is I actually photographed all of these creatures on just two different sunflowers. So I was talking before about how ecosystem can be really small. An ecosystem can be just a flower. Sometimes creatures spend their entire lives on these flowers. So I just, I think that's really cool. Um, so I think this was started by the Xerces Society. Not 100% sure on that, but the Leave the Leaves campaign, which is something everyone could do in their yards. So leaves provide valuable organic matter to healthy soil. So they also work as weed suppression and moisture retention. And this is something that actually bees, butterflies, wasps overwinter under as well. So this is a alternative approach to mulch. But if you do have mulch in your yard, I would recommend that maybe you not put more than two to three inches because it'll actually kind of starve out the oxygen for a lot of creatures that are trying to overwinter there. So a lot of like queen bees or founderses will actually overwinter there. And if they don't have a place to overwinter or they get suffocated, um, that's going to be an issue for them next year. They're obviously not going to make it. So bee houses. Um, one thing about, so I'm not a huge fan of bee houses, but I know a lot of people like them. Uh, if you do create a healthy ecosystem in your yard, you don't actually need a bee house. Bee houses are more for people than bees. Um, and I think it's just for people to kind of observe them more so. But if you are going to get a bee house, I wanted to provide you an example of what is a good bee house to put in your yard. So a lot of times bee houses are actually designed not with bees in mind. They're just designed to sell. So if you do get a bee house, you want to get one that's at least six inches deep. You want to get one that you're able to clean out. So you actually want to be able to take apart the cells and take the um, developing cocoons out and clean them off. Um, and then also, so Weebee Houses, it's uh, W-E-E-B-E-E -E -E House. You can find them on Instagram. They also have a little drawer at the top. So after you take out the cocoons, clean them, you can actually put them in the drawer at the top so they can emerge when they're supposed to. Um, I know a lot of people aren't aware of this, but female bees can actually control if they're laying a male or a female egg. And they typically lay male eggs closer to the entrance and females closer to the back, which is typically why females are larger than males because they take longer to develop. Um, so if you have the uh, little 
uh, drawer at the top of your bee house, you can actually put them in there, clean them out. So this is an example of something that went viral online. It's a bee brick, and if you notice, it's less than six inches, and there's no way to actually clean this out. Um, the one thing that was really positive about the way they were advertising it, they were recommending you put it so high up in your house, bees are probably going to find it. Um, so you want to have a product that you can clean out. If you do have a bee house already and you can't take apart the cells, one thing that I'd recommend is getting biodegradable paper straws, and you can actually put them in the cells. And once it's the end of the bee season, you can actually um, take them apart, clean everything out. And then another thing with bee houses, too, is a lot of the companies will actually sell uh, bees that they say are native bees. But just because a bee is not a honeybee doesn't mean it's native to your area. So like I was saying before, um, how there's bees that can be native to all of the United States, California, or your zip code. Just because a bee is like a mason bee or an osmia bee, I wouldn't recommend buying it because you don't know where that bee is native to. So what can happen if you have a bee house that you don't clean out? Um, all these little things on the bees are called mites are mites. Um, so typically, like some bees will just have a few mites, but if you have a bee house that you never clean out, you can have a lot of these sporadic mites on the bee, and they actually transfer during mating as well, so it can stop the bees from flying. Um, I consider like a bee house that you don't clean out, so like maybe a dog house. If you have a dog that you keep outside all the time in a little pen, and you never clean it out, it's kind of like the dog can get sick, so the same thing can happen with bees. So I uh, went on YouTube, and I found some instructional videos for how to clean out your bee house. So these are really good examples. I don't know if anyone wants to take a picture of that at all, but they give you great examples of how to clean out the bee houses, different instructions. So I was talking before about how you don't have to actually put water out for bees. If you do put water out for bees, does anyone notice what bees are being attracted? Honeybees, Honey exactly. So if you have a native yard and you put water out for bees, you're attracting more honeybees to your yard. So it's a good idea to keep that in mind. But if you do find a bee that is grounded, even if it is a honeybee, if it's a native bee as well, you never want to give them honey. Um, that's because honey can actually have pathogens in it that can be spread between hives. So if you do have a, a honeybee and you know it came from your hive, you can give it that honey. But if it's a native bee, what you can actually do is mix two parts water and then one part sugar, um, feed it to a bee, it'll perk right up, fly away. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> I am not really a native bee, just so you know. <laughs> um, if you all have any questions, please use the mic in the back. Um, um, Crystal is ready to answer any question you have related to bees. And I do actually have a question for you oh. since I'm here. Um, I know there, at least a couple of years ago, there was a thing going on called zombie bees. I don't know if you heard of that, um, that thing. So it was about these uh, parasite, I guess they somehow use bee as a host and then kind of leave stuff on them and then eventually it, it will get the bees to be very disoriented. They tend to fight towards the light or something and then they would die. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's um, called zombie bee. I'm not familiar with that. Um, I know there's a lot of things that will sort of, is it like a, a was it a fungus or was it actually an insect? It was an insect. Oh. Yeah, they actually use it as a host to lay eggs in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then oh. when it's ready to come out, I want to say it was the, a type of fly. It was a type of fly? Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of flies and wasps that are parasites mm -hmm. of bees. I'm not familiar with that one, mm -hmm. but there's certain ones where the, the female, I'll, I'll talk about wasps, I guess, mm -hmm. they'll actually um, kind of live in the body of the bee and they'll stick their little abdomen out, and males will actually find the bee with the abdomen of the female wasp sticking out and they'll mate with the the back end of the female while they're still living in the bee. Um, I know there's also 
I have seen a honeybee infected with cordyceps, like kind of like similar to The Last of Us, where they'll actually climb up high on a stem and then fungus spores will kind of come out of them. Um, there's also the bee that I showed you before, the diadacea bee that was sleeping in the little chimney with their legs up. So they create those chimneys because there's a lot of parasites that will actually try and go into their burrows and kill their babies, kind of like the parasitic bees, but there's also flies that'll hover above their burrows and just toss eggs down mm -hmm. as well. Um, but yeah, I'll have to look into what you were talking about. That sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's, it, was, it was something that happened, I think, back in, yeah, about a couple years ago, and it's also a citizen science project. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they were encouraged people to build a little, a little trap with a light in it, and then you will end up attracting these these bees that's being um, infected, I guess, you know, have, oh. a, have a parasite. Oh. And then they were just flying around the light, like totally disoriented, and then at one point they just drop and die. Oh, unfortunately. Wow. okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not a very... Thanks, Vivian. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we have a question. Yes. Hi, well, first of all, I'd like to say this was fantastic. Thank you so much for being here today. I learned a lot. Like. And if I may make a comment first, because sure. I thought about it when you showed the green lace wings, mm -hmm. and I really never seen green green lace ladybugs and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the first time I ever got to finally see the green lace wing eggs was right here at the library. Oh no because, way! Because um, a few years ago I went with the I forget the name of it. I think it was called Wild LA. It oh was, yeah. 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 They had a, they had a program here, and then afterwards we went out to the to the patio there. And, um, you know, so they had lots of different projects for us to do, but one of them, they were the, like these eagle-eyed girls who, they're closer to the ground, but they actually discovered them. Oh, I, so that's So we got amazing. to all see it. So that was the first time I've ever seen, in real life seen Green Lace Week. And so maybe, you know, we could all stop out there today. And yeah, look, yeah, and you, you might still see some eggs out there or some empty eggs at least. That's amazing. Yeah, that oh. was so cool. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I'm so glad you mentioned that about the bee houses and stuff, but I, I was wondering, like I see people too who just make the tubes. I mean, that's a big project now for kids to do, like make your own. Does that, the, I've never even heard, I wouldn't even, I'm glad you had those things because I would never have known how to clean one out or anything like that or do anything, but does that include all the stuff that the, they have the projects for kids to do that you have to clean them out or is that? Yeah, you have to clean all of them out. Oh. Um, yeah, so if, if they're just drilling holes, again, just get the paper biodegradable straws, just stick the straws in there, and when the bees have them sealed up, uh -huh. um, wait a couple of months. It's, it's really good to know what bees are in there as well. Typically, it's going to be like an osmia or a mason bee or a leaf cutter or medikaili, um, so uh -huh. just kind of be aware when it's like off-season and just when they're completely capped up, that's a good time when they're actually developed into cocoons to clean them out. Okay, yeah. but what about in real life, like the man in the documentary had the bee city thing, does that, does that like self-clean because it's in nature or how does that work there? It, it does not self-clean, no. So that's one of the ones, so you'll see those in a lot of people's yards and a lot of times the bees will have mites on them. Oh, okay. Yeah. May I make one more comment? Sure. Um, do you happen to know the Adams? She's the person who um, designed the, the garden at the Arboretum, the Crescent Garden. What's her name? Oh, Lee Adams? Yeah. I do know her, yes. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of know her too, and she's, um, and so they have all kinds of like studio, just a plug for them, um, <laughs> Studio Petrichor. Yeah, they yeah, no, the, well. yeah. Yeah, they design, if anybody's interested, they design, well, the, the water, you know, trap the water and they stuff did, in yeah. there. So check, check out um, Studio Petrichor. <laughs> yeah, they actually, uh, they worked at the Crescent Farm as well, too. So you'll yeah. see a lot of Lee's, uh, she makes these mosaic sort of right. stones. Yeah. So if you see those there, those are hers as well. So, and again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Great talk. Um, there's so much I definitely learned from this, and I'm speaking as somebody who, like you said, I'm, I actually am both community scientist and, and an actual scientist. I got my degree in biology and such. So oh, wonderful. Yeah, I always like to come to these kinds of things and learn perspectives from anybody, really. And you, just from this alone, I've learned so much m more about bees than I've ever learned in much of my stuff, whether it be course catalog stuff or <laughs> actually being out in the field. 
Um, one peculiar question, or I can ask many questions, but I do want to keep things short. Um, there are two main questions that come to me. One okay. is, when you brought up about how European bees are more generalist and such, and then you have your native bees, they're much more specialized, mm -hmm. and then how much European honeybees they rely on actual water. When these droughts hit, um, do our do our native bees fare better in the drought conditions, like when the drought's happening, compared to European honeybees? So that's a really complicated question to answer. Um, so one thing that I've noticed, and again, I've only been working with native bees specifically since 2018, but what I've noticed is there's something called diapause that a lot of bees will go into, plants go into it as well. It's an extended hibernation. So sometimes bees will disappear for multiple years underground. And I think the longest that someone has ever seen a bee go into diapause was about 10 years. So sometimes it's kind of hard to tell if the bees have actually died or if they're in extended diet pause like the flowers around them. Um, but what I will say is consistently, every single year I am seeing honeybees, neighborhoods, deserts, mountain ranges, everywhere, but the native bee populations are going up and down a lot. And also if you kind of do spend a lot of time in the, in the same locations year after year, I have noticed that when resources are less plentiful, a lot of times the bees are smaller that are appearing. Um, so I don't know, it's kind of a complicated question to answer, but I definitely see more fluctuation in native bees and native plants, just native creatures in general, opposed to honeybees. Thank you. Yeah. so much, Crystal, for being here today, really for sharing with all these, the knowledge you have about the bees, and I've learned so much myself, and I think I probably won't be so scared wasp from now on. <laughs> I always think they're going to just stun me, stink me, like, even when I just walk past by, but I'm just, you know, everything is a learning process. And, oh, one more question for yes. you. So, for the, um, the aphids, it's on the milkweed. So, you're saying, in our case, I mean, I was told I should just use soap water and spray them, make sure they're all dead, so I should just leave them? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> That's a little what I would say is if you get rid of the aphids, you're less likely to have the beneficial insects that will control them. Mm -hmm. So if you spray um, pesticides on things, you're gonna get rid of the insects kind of lower on the food chain first, and they're also gonna be the first ones to reappear. Mm -hmm. It's gonna take multiple years potentially for other insects that are gonna control the population. Um, so one thing that I, I found is really helpful is if you have a, a yard or a friend has a native yard, um, if you actually just kind of plant plants next to them, it's kind of like a native landscaping bridge, a lot of their beneficial insects will actually travel to where you are as well. I know a lot of times people will buy ladybugs or a lot of different creatures, again, just like honeybees or native bees, they could be not native to where you are. Um, I think maybe like a horticulturalist like John at the Crescent Farm can answer this better, but if you are spraying things to get rid of the aphids, um, there's going to be a lot less creatures to population control them as well. Okay. So, it. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's good. Crystal, a big round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for attending today's LA BioBlitz special program. And we hope you will register on iNaturalist account. Am I if on the right one? Yes. If, if you, you haven't yet, which I have. It's on my phone. It's been on my phone for a while. And I was joining all the, all the California native bees. Right when you were speaking, I joined up. Um, and what else do we want to say? Uh, we really want to reach our goal of 10,000 observations, and I was just checking, and I think we're at 4,000, so come on, we need your help. Um, we want to reach that by October 31st. And with your contribution, the biodiversity researchers and the policymakers of the city will be able to uh, protect the many and wild animals, plants that call LA home. So please check out our LA BioBlitz Challenge page at lapl.org forward slash BioBlitz, B I O B L. I T Z, and for more for, for more uh, programs this October. So we are having different branches are offering um, different kind of BioBlitz programs. 
Um, our next major LA BioBlitz event will be a collaboration with the City of LA Recreation and Park on October 28th, that's a Saturday, at 4 p.m. Join us at Griffith Park for a spooky nature walk and ecologist Courtney McCannon, and be sure to register for the event, and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much. And just a couple of things before you leave. So uh, please don't forget to stop by the check-in uh, check table. You can pick up a pack or two of the native plant seeds uh, to help our city to be a pollinator-friendly habitat. And also, please, um, some of you might already have the, uh, the bracelet that has a number on it. Um, you will be getting a pack of these native bee flashcards or bees of native bees of Western US. Uh, flashcards that's actually created by Crystal Heckman. So thank you all again and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Oh, and if you want an autograph of, <laughs> of <laughs> Crystal's name on it, you want her autograph, she can do that for you, right? Yeah, yeah do an autograph for deck. <laughs> so you can meet us out there at the check-in table. Thank you.